Hi, Plant Family. I'm Chris, and I want to welcome you to our online campus. If you're new and interested in getting connected with us, send us a quick message or fill out our Connect card on our website. We'd love to hear from you. As we get ready to worship today, I want to invite you to do three things. Engage, greet, and give. First, engage. Engaging with an online worship gathering is a unique experience, so here are a few ways we've found to help get the most out of it. Be fully present. Put away your other devices and the distractions. Get out your Bible and notepad and settle in. Worship, don't just watch. God wants to meet us right where we are as we lean into His presence. So let's worship like He's right here with us in our homes instead of just listening to the music and the message. Contribute. Take a minute to share what Jesus is teaching you. You can do this in the comments or reach out to a friend and just process God's invitations and His challenges to you from today's gathering. Next, greet someone. Take a minute right now to say hello in the comments. Introduce yourself and where you are watching from. We have people connecting with us from around the world and we love seeing our online community get to know each other. And finally, give. We can't thank you enough for all those who have supported the work of the gospel through the Plant Church. As you give, you allow the work of the gospel to continue. We want to thank all of you who have given to the Plant Church. And we want to invite all those who haven't already to give to the work of the gospel through our website, theplantchurch.org forward slash give. It's great to have you with us. Let's worship together. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given. My morning grew quiet, my fear rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your end. displayed on a criminal's cross darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell that's when death was arrested my life began oh your grace so is over me you have made me new now life begins with you 
Hello, Plant Family. Pastor Jeremy here. I'm so glad to be joining you for this online worship gathering. How many of you enjoy the summer and like spending time outdoors playing sports or activities? You know, there is one sport out there that is probably one of the best sports in the world. You get to play in the beautiful outdoors on exclusive 18 whole courses from New Jersey and Georgia, and Hawaii, and Arizona, and Dubai, and, and Scotland. This sport requires an incredible amount of skill. You are out there on the green, and this requires a, a very high degree of concentration and, and focus and muscle memory. And this is considered one of the most amazing sports that are out there. And it's played all throughout the Western world. Does anyone know what sport this is? And if you're thinking golf, that's a no. No, this is not golf. This is the great sport of miniature golf. This is miniature golf. You know, there's a joke saying that regular golf is for all the young athletes who couldn't make it in miniature golf because it was too hard. And they threw in the towel on their dreams. Do you know that there is actually a professional miniature golf league, the U.S. Pro Mini Golf Association, the, the U.S. PMGA, and they have master's level championships with green jackets for elite mini golfers. You know, every time we go on vacation, we, we like to, to hit what we think is one of the world-class championship mini golf courses like the Flamingo Mini Golf in Long Beach Island or the Pirate Island Mini Golf Course in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina or the most famous monster golf course in the great world-class city of Paramus, New Jersey, to name a few. When my son first started playing mini golf, what, 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 golf, what he would do is he would pick up the putter and use it as if it were a driver. And not knowing his own strength and from what he just sees on TV, even though the, the, the hole is just a few yards away, he would wind up and smash the ball far across into someone else's green on the mini golf course. I had to teach him how to be gentle. I had to teach him that every time that he hit with the putter, he had to have the right combination of both power and precision. This summer, we are in a sermon series called The Fruit of the Spirit. What does it mean to be connected to Jesus, the vine, our source of life, allowing his spirit to change us from the inside out? This Sunday, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness. What does it mean to exhibit gentleness, the gentleness of Christ? So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 25. And let me read that for you. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You know, the Greek word used here for the word gentleness is preotes, which means mild or meek, even keeled. And the ability to have strength that is under control. You know, there's a passage in Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through through 21, that helps illustrate this idea of gentleness. Let's read it together. Matthew 12, 9 to 21. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Then Jesus went over to their synagogue, where he noticed a man who man with a deformed hand. The Pharisees asked Jesus, Does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? They were hoping he would say yes so he could bring charges against him. And he answered, If you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to the man, Hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored, just like the other one. Then the Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. But Jesus knew what they were planning. So he left the area, and many people followed him. He healed all the sick among them, but he warned them not to reveal who he was. So in this passage, once again, Jesus is going head-to-head with the Pharisees, head-to-head with these religious leaders. And because he's been building a following over time, healing people along the way, winning the hearts of the people, they felt that, the religious leaders felt that he was a very real threat to the established order. So essentially what they wanted to do is they wanted to catch him in the act of breaking a law. Now, this is probably not the case, but I wouldn't have been surprised if they staged this by planting that, that man with the deformed hand right there in that synagogue. You know, we will never know. But the religious leaders asked Jesus, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? You see, the Sabbath was a day of rest. You were not allowed to work You were not allowed to to, to do these things. And Jesus said, if a sheep falls into a well, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course. How much more valuable is it to do good on the Sabbath? You know, these laws and customs at the time were so stringent that it was thought in that time that you could only help someone on the Sabbath if their life was in danger. Otherwise, they would just have to wait to the next day. As in the case with this man with a deformed hand, his life wasn't in danger, so he could have been healed maybe the next day. But then all of a sudden, Jesus asks the man to stretch out his hand, and he healed him right there in front of everyone. These leaders, instead of celebrating and worshiping God at this act of love and compassion. They were filled with anger and they plotted how to kill Jesus. And Jesus, knowing what they were planning, decided to leave the area and the people followed him away. So what are some important lessons that we could learn today about this idea of gentleness? And the first is this. Gentleness is power and precision. Gentleness is power and precision. See, throughout Jesus' ministry, he displays the perfect combination of both power and precision. There are many times in which he displays power, where there are dramatic healings of people, where he is casting out evil demons, where he's speaking the truth 
in the face of clear opposition, where he's turning over the tables in the temple. But in stark contrast, there are also times in which Jesus displays a very calculated precision. Coming to, into Jerusalem on a peaceful donkey instead of as a warrior on a horse. Telling the people who have been healed not to go and tell anyone because his time had not come yet. Letting the children come to him for a blessing when his disciples were opposed to that. Identifying himself as a shepherd that cares. And in this particular instance, the religious leaders, they were ready to trap him. But he did not retreat. He did not shy away from this man who was in need. But in the midst of this tense situation, he stepped in and he did a public healing in front of everyone, knowing that there could be clear repercussions against him. The leaders decided to plot to kill him. You know, Jesus could have stayed there at his moment and verbally battled these guys and have shown them off with a display of power and, and, and everything, causing this big scene and this big riot. Remember, the crowd was actually on his side. They, they stayed with him and they followed him. He could have turned the crowd in a violent uprising against these leaders. But instead, he chose to leave the area. Now, gentleness doesn't mean that you are weak. It doesn't mean that you are a wimp or that you are fearful. But what it rather means is that you have an internal power that is expressed with precision in different circumstances and situations. Gentleness means that you have a high degree of maturity to respond appropriately, just like Jesus did. Gentleness means that you have strength that is under control. And because Jesus was filled with the Spirit and he was living in the Spirit, regardless of how much strength he had, he always responded the right way to the right person in the right circumstance at the right time. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember a time in your life in which you did not have strength that was under control? Do you remember a situation in which in your anger you overreacted in a way that was overkill or inappropriate or overbearing, where your response far outweighed the situation that you were in? Maybe in a situation with your child or your spouse or a, a coworker. And on the flip side, do you remember a serious situation in which you did not respond in a way that quite did justice? Either you didn't speak up appropriately, or you did not respond with a firm response. You did not step in. And maybe your lack of response spoke more loudly than words. Which side do you lean? more toward responding with too much power or too little. You see, without the Spirit, we, we either live in one place or another. And it's only through the guidance of God's Holy Spirit that we know how to do both. How many of you out there need some, some wisdom in, in how to do the right thing at the right time? You know, over the years, I, I've had the privilege to, to watch Pastor Rob and be mentored by him. And, and I got to see him, how he ministers to many people from afar. And I've seen that there are situations and, and people in which he has to respond with strength and firmness and, and directness out of love because that is their personality and because of the situation that, that they are in. But at the same time, there are times in which he is soft-spoken and speaks words of comfort and, and communicates with indirect indirectness to connect with a certain individual. 
And both these responses are, are not interchangeable with different people and, and different situations. And it could backfire if you respond the wrong way to the wrong person at the wrong time. Gentleness is knowing how to respond with power and precision. So how do we do this? How do we live this out? And that brings us to our next point. Gentleness is an attitude. Gentleness is an attitude of how we live our life. So how many of you here like going mini golfing? You know, what I've noticed about some of the best mini golfers and also golfers is the fact that, that, that the, the ones who are the best are oftentimes the ones that are not the, 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 the big talkers and not the ones that are most outwardly prideful. But the best golfers are the ones that are focused and humble. The ones whom you least expect. They have the right attitude. And as we continue in this passage in, in Matthew chapter 12, we gain more insight into why Jesus acts and responds the way that he does. So let's continue on looking at Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 17. Jesus, God's chosen servant. This fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him. Look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious. And his name will be the hope of the world. So this passage here is a messianic prophecy of Jesus from Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. And it refers to Jesus as God's servant. That God's spirit was, was on him. God's spirit was empowering him to proclaim justice, to bring victory, and through his name to be, bring hope to all the world. But he would not do that with violence or wars or, or uprisings. But rather, he would do this through gentleness. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public, as what we've seen in this passage. He will not crush the weakest reed or flickering candle. This is referring to those who are in need, those who are sick, those who are weak, those who are vulnerable. And we know in an ultimate display of power, he submitted to the Father through his death on the cross bringing life and resurrection to all of humanity. The question I have for you is, do you remember a time in your life in which you were vulnerable? Maybe you were hurting emotionally or physically, going through a difficult circumstance, or maybe you had sinned or done something that was gravely wrong and you felt bad and you felt guilt and you felt shame. But someone who responded to you, responded to you with gentleness. And their response changed how you responded and how you continued on with your life. The question we have to ask ourselves is that, do we have the same attitude of Christ? Do we have the same attitude of gentleness? Do the people around us know you for your gentleness with them. Gentleness is power and precision. Gentleness is an attitude that we, that we carry. And third, gentleness requires wisdom. Gentleness requires wisdom. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. You might be thinking, bro, what's all this talk about gentleness? You're talking about gentleness and gentleness. What, what is this, a, a baby products commercial talking about the gentleness of shampoo, baby shampoo and all these things? And you might be thinking, you know what? I don't need to sit here and hear all about gentleness. Gentleness is for babies. But me, I'm rough and tough. 
I want to use my strength. I want to use force. I want to get pumped up. I want to get things done with people. That's the only way to have a right attitude in life and to make things happen. Instead of preaching about gentleness, let's talk about King David cutting off Goliath's head. Let's talk about the Israelites defeating their enemies. Well, bro, let me tell you one instance in which you will not argue against gentleness. How many of you out there have ever had a surgery before or ever felt anxious about having one? Oh, right. If you've had a surgery or a medical procedure, you know what is at risk. You only have one body and you want a surgeon who is gentle, who is precise, and who is accurate. That's all that matters. How many of you remember that that board game, uh, that sort of board game, that kids game called Operation, where you have these little tweezers and you have to remove the wishbone from this, from this patient. And if you touch the sides, you hear that you get freaked out and you hear this terrible jarring buzz and you get shocked and it's like zzzz. And you're, and you're freaking out because you, you feel so bad that you just, just probably killed this person. You know, I think that game has traumatized generations of kids who maybe originally wanted to be doctors and surgeons, and, and after playing that game, they, they, they might have changed their career paths. Or maybe some, some of the others decided to, to go into medicine because of that. But nowadays, there's, there's technology that is so advanced using the, these high-tech robots in surgery, high-tech robotic surgery where surgeons can grab controls and joysticks virtually to maneuver tiny, sharp instruments that can conduct a surgery with a high degree of precision, more precision than, than, than a human can with their, with their tactile hands. Doing a surgery and doing what needs to be done with less error, minimal collateral damage, and optimal chance for healing. You see, when God deals with us, he always does so with such great care and such great concern. And this should be our priority too, as believers, when we deal with others. While the world may celebrate and and tell us to deal with others harshly and, and, and vengefully, gentleness gives us the ability to deal with people and their hearts with precision, the way that God would, with minimal collateral damage, causing maybe less errors, and creating more of a capacity for that person to find healing and wholeness. Wisdom allows us to deal with different people correctly in different ways. Well, what are some examples? First, How do we react when we deal with those who are trying to help us? You know, gentleness requires humility. You know, how many of us out there are willing to allow other people to to speak into our lives and correct us when needed, when we're wrong? Sometimes when we we feel corrected, we feel the need to be defensive and we want to prove ourselves. we 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 want to lash out. But we should be humble and allow others to speak into our lives. We have an opportunity to to display this gentleness when people confront us, whether our children or or our spouses or or our bosses, people that have well intentions, and they may may or may not have the right form, but they are well intentioned. Do we take our frustrations out of them, out to them? Or do we respond with gentleness? Or how about when we need to respond to people that have fallen into sin? You know, when others have sinned or done something bad or sinned against us or or others and let us down, how do we respond to them? Do we crush them? Do we demean them? Do we make them feel guilt and shame? Galatians 6, 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently 
and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation as yourself. You see, when Jesus was confronted by the religious leaders with the woman who was caught in adultery and was about to be stoned, how did he respond to the woman? He was gentle. He shielded her. He protected her. But at the same time, he didn't condone the sin or condemn her. But he told her to go and sin no more. Can you imagine if Jesus dealt harshly with this woman who was already being treated horribly by the religious leaders? How would that have changed her life? How would that have changed her view of God? For a God that that wasn't merciful and loving and and forgiving, but rather a God that is vengeful and angry. Jesus' response to that woman changed everything for her and brought her back to a place of repentance. Or what about when we have to deal with people and situations of injustice? How do we react? If we're Facing a confrontational type of person, instead of being combative or retreating, there are times where we need to speak the truth in firmness and gentleness. There are certain times if if we fight, it'll backfire, it won't work. And there are also times if we retreat, it'll also not work. Yes, I do know that Jesus had to take action when he turned over the tables in the temple. Now, I'm not giving you the license to to go to your workplace and start turning over tables or or your community and doing all these things, but uh, but, but what was happening during during that scene? Money changers were exploiting people. There was an injustice that was taking place. There were Gentiles and people far from the Lord that were genuinely coming to the temple for worship, for asking forgiveness, for wanting to to learn and connect with the God Yahweh. And in the midst of of them coming there, there's all this chaos that was going on and, and, and financial exploitation. And it was creating so many barriers and distractions from the true worship of God. So Jesus, in that situation, he, he responded in a certain way. When you are faced with a difficult injustice or a serious matter, don't be combative. Don't get angry, but, but speak the truth. Speak up. Stay under control. Don't fear. Don't retreat. And if you are the person that is wrong, remember, it's not about who's right or wrong or winning or losing. Just back down. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer deflects anger, but a harsh word makes tempers flare. Use wisdom. Or what about in in just any old circumstance where you are faced with some kind of unanticipated situation that you don't even expect? Dealing with frustrated people or or nice people or circumstances beyond your control. When in doubt, always be wise. Always respond appropriately. Stay humble and put others first. Philippians 2, 3-4 says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Gentleness requires wisdom. So we've seen first that gentleness is power and precision. Gentleness is an attitude that we carry. And that gentleness requires wisdom. Maybe there are some of you out there listening and you feel that you are far away from the Lord. You feel far away from the Lord and you have been staying far away from him because you don't think that he can handle your sin, that he can't handle your past, and he's not willing to forgive. But let me tell you this. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you 
is light. You see, God has dealt harshly with your sin through Jesus' death on the cross so that he can respond to you now with kindness and mercy. And it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. If you choose to receive this, you have new life and he gives you a new heart. Maybe there's some of you out there that you have been following Jesus, but your interactions with people have often been misjudged or misguided. I want to give you the opportunity to just invite the Holy Spirit in. Say, Holy Spirit, change my character. Change me from the inside out. Grant me the wisdom that I need to be gentle. Allow this to be part of the attitude that that I live out. To love and respond to others in the way that God wants me to do. So as we meditate on that, let's spend a few moments in worship as we allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in our hearts. Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Lord bless you Make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Oh, oh, oh. 
Plant family, I want to thank you so much for joining us here for this worship gathering. And I want to challenge you this week. Continue to step into the things of God. Continue to allow the Spirit to give you wisdom to change you, to, to change the way that you live, so that the gentleness you live out in wisdom shows others who the living Christ is. Thank you. God bless.